When I was a, uh, a younger teenager or a younger child, I faced um, a challenge much like many of you have faced. And I, I, would, I would venture to say that uh, many of you have faced this challenge and have done uh, decently well with it at times, while maybe at other times you have faced this challenge and have not done super well with it or uh, maybe have done intentionally horribly with it. Uh, but we all face this challenge uh, more than one time in our life. So uh, a little bit about my childhood. When I was, uh, I was an Air Force, I grew up an Air Force brat. Um, so my dad served in the Air Force, which doesn't actually mean brat, by the way, in the, you might, the way that you might think of it. If you had known me, that you might still be thinking that. But, you know, it means British Regiment Attached Traveler. So it's an actual acronym for something. But anyway, so I grew up an Air Force brat, and we, uh, we moved around. In my elementary years, we lived in Rapid City, South Dakota, uh, from, uh, from, yeah, really from kindergarten up through, uh, through sixth grade. And so uh, I was out playing with a friend. And uh, before I tell you about this particular challenge, I should first tell you about a gift that I got from, uh, from my parents. Now, before I go into this, kids, I just want to encourage you to lean up or to sit up and really listen in today because this passage is really uh, starts by addressing you guys. So I want you guys to just lean in and try to listen to everything that the Lord has for you as children, uh, even this morning today. But anyway, so I had gotten this gift uh, from my parents earlier in the year, and um, I opened it up, and it was a long rectangular box, and it was a Daisy Pump BB gun. Right? I mean, it's like before the days of airsoft, but it was just an old-fashioned BB gun, and, uh, and you, had a pump, you, know, you could pump it and all that sort of thing. So I just thought it was the coolest thing ever. My dad took me out in the backyard that day and uh, taught me how to use it. We had some target practice, you know, and he told me, you know, some of the basic rules like what? Don't ever point this in the direction of another person. Never, ever, right? This is not a, a Nerf gun. This is a BB gun. And a little bit of a different animal there. So don't ever point this at someone and never point it at uh, animals or never point it at a vehicle. That was an important one too because people are inside those vehicles too. So I had these rules down and my dad and I did some target practice and, and, uh, and I just thought I was an all-around pro right out of the gates. I mean, those paper plates were trembling as they stood there. So um, I don't know if the BBs actually penetrated the plate actually, but... Uh, uh, they would hit the play. But anyway, so we had, some, we had some fun that afternoon. And one day, not too much longer, I was out playing with a friend. And um, so I had taken uh, this BB gun, and we were over at, at his house. And, uh, and he had some woods around his house. Now, in, in Rapid City, South Dakota, you have lots of ready-made targets. There are pine cones everywhere in Rapid City, South Dakota, or in the Black Hills out there. And so pine cones all over the place, plenty of things to shoot at. And so, but one time, we, we climbed a tree through the this thing on my back, and we, you know, scurried up a tree, and we were shoot, shooting at pine cones that were in a tree and seeing if we could knock them out, which BB guns don't do too well at. But anyway, we were having a good time. But I just felt like I needed a, a greater challenge, you know, something that was a little further away. And so uh, I saw these really um, sturdy rubber tires that, you know, a BB gun couldn't hurt those tires because the BBs would just bounce right off of those wheels, right? Right off those tires. And so as I set my sights, literally in my mind anyway, before I ever pulled this BB gun up to my shoulder, the Holy Spirit, because I was young, but I was already uh, one who had repented of my sins and trusted Jesus to who paid the penalty for my sins. And so I was a Christian as a child, and I, I heard or I, I knew the Holy Spirit reminding me of a couple things. Never point this at a car or people and obey your father. So I knew these rules. And in that moment, I thought, oh, it'll be okay. I've got really good aim. And I thought I could control the outcome of it. And so I pulled this BB gun up to my shoulder and set my sights and I closed my eye and almost like it was yesterday, I will never forget the sound of that window shattering. So do I disobey or do I obey? 
I could use the gift that my mother and father gave me in the way that they intended it, or I could take matters into my own hands literally and say, I think I know better in life. I think that even as a child, I know that as long as I can control the outcome or so I thought, it would be okay to disobey my parents. Why? Well, because they wouldn't ever know. Except the plan went awry. And they found out, as I'll tell you more about in a few minutes. Uh, the Apostle Paul writes this letter to the church in Ephesus. Now, kids, I want you to understand something. When we hold up this Bible that we live our lives according to, and we believe with all of our hearts that this Bible is God's inspired or breathed out word that he gave to human authors using their personality, but every page that we read in the original languages is, uh, is intended by God to communicate very specific things to us that we live our lives according to. It was not always bound in these 66 books that may be a couple thousand pages as you hold it in your hand, depending on what kind of Bible you have. So the Apostle Paul wrote this letter that was going to be circulated or passed around from one church to another church to another church in, uh, in Asia Minor or in what, what is now modern-day Turkey, okay? And so on the southwestern area of Turkey is Ephesus, and, and they would stand up together, and the, some adults would take this letter from the Apostle Paul, and they would read this this letter. And as he read a lot of this letter, the Apostle Paul explains, um, as he's reading out, out loud to everyone, he paints this beautiful picture of who God is and, and how rich or how lavish God is in mercy uh, to love us by sending his own son to live a perfect life. That means obeying the Father every time the Father told him to do something, he did it. If there was something the Father told him not to do, he didn't do it. Jesus obeyed the Father perfectly every time. And he died on the cross to pay the punishment, the penalty for my disobedience, like disobeying my dad on that day. And like I would imagine, as you face the same kinds of challenges, disobey your parents. And even I bet you if you talk to your mom and dad, they'll probably tell you some stories about how they disobeyed their parents as well. But it's just a guess here. Um, but the reason that God is so rich in mercy is because God, now listen to this, God is communicating a, a, uh, a, a big picture to the entire universe. We, we, we're finite, we're, we're temporal, we're going to live for a while and then we're all going to die one day. And, and what Paul is saying is God is, is telling a much bigger story than any one of us or even all of us in this room put together. So God is, is Paul is painting this big, uh, beautiful masterpiece that he wants the church to learn, to remember, hey, listen, it's not all about you. In fact, it's all about God. And God is telling this marvelous story and you're a part of it, but you're not the central character. God is the central character. And so he's using Ephesians to help this church begin to understand this. And so he is showing the immeasurable or the, uh, the, 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 the countless riches of God's grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus to all of the spiritual forces in the heavenly places, to all of the heavenlies. Not just Shellsburg or Iowa or the United States or the world, but all of the heavenlies. There's a bigger screenplay going on here in the world than you and I think about in each of our daily decisions. And so this is why Paul tells us just a few verses earlier that we're to walk in the Spirit, we're to, we're to walk in or live in love, we're to imitate God, right? we're to try to copy God as much as possible according to the Bible. And why? Well, because we are children of God who've been deeply loved by God. And when someone loves you, you want to love them back. And God says, here's how, here's how you love me. Trust me, believe me, even when it doesn't make sense. And by God's grace, do your very best to follow me each step of every day. So Ephesians 6, 1 through 4, and then we'll read a parallel passage in Colossians 3, 20 and 21. And then today, I'm going to be addressing children, and then next week, parents, come back because we're going to be addressing, um, addressing you as parents. So children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Now, if you're sitting by your parents, you might want to move over just a little bit because, because they might do this thing to you like throughout the whole sermon, right? They might be like, hey, listen to Pastor Matt, listen to Pastor Matt. Well, I promise you, your day's coming next Sunday. 
And then you can get your elbow ready to go for your mom and dad too, okay? So children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with the promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now, the parallel passage in Colossians is very similar. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Children, children, you need to surrender to the Spirit of God by obeying your parents with a happy heart, and you will enjoy God's lasting blessing. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. That's the first point he says here. So Paul has already started this pattern of speaking to those who are to to submit to or to render themselves to the person that, that God has put in authority out of his wisdom. He's done that first with wives submitting to husbands, and then he tells husbands how they're to love their wives as Christ loved the church. So we, we must assume this. When Paul is writing this in a day when children were treated uh, much, much, um, much, uh, more utilitarian, shall we say, than we do our children today. We live in a day, parents, of, uh, of you might even call it child worship. We believe that our culture tells us that our children have to have everything that they want in order to feel satisfied, in order to have their self-esteem propped up to the right uh, level of what they think it might be. The problem is that's terribly subjective and not anything like what the Word of God says. Uh, so we are not to prioritize our children according to meeting their needs, according to what our children think they are, but according to what God says that they are. And so as Paul is writing, there are children sitting in this church, just like you guys, hearing this as kind of a message or hearing this letter read. And so if you can understand the words that I'm saying right now, God is speaking to you from his Bible, and he wants you to hear everything that he says, and he wants you to put it into practice, right? That means they're probably younger than teenagers, but it certainly includes teenagers, if you're a dependent, if you're on your mom and dad's insurance, if you live in their home, uh, anything like that, right? This word would be for you from children all the way up, all right? Um, obey your parents or honor your parents. So he's saying not only Christian parents. When he says, obey your parents in the Lord, he's not saying only if your parents are Christians. What he's saying is obey your parents as though you're obeying the Lord. Obey your parents in a way that honors the Lord, which means that kids, uh, teenagers, your job is to walk in the Spirit. You see, this is not a, a series of verses that's all on its own right here. Uh, everything that Paul has already said in Ephesians kind of sets the stage for this, right? Walking in the Spirit, forgiving one another, not holding on to bitterness. All of these things apply to how we're to walk uh, according to honoring the Lord. And so, in support of this, uh, he adds this phrase which is taken from Exodus and Deuteronomy. Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right, for this is the first, or honor your father and mother. And Exodus tells us, honor your father and mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Deuteronomy 5.16 says, honor your father and mother as the Lord God commanded you, that your days may be long and that it may go well with you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. So when he says in the Lord, and in Colossians, he says, for it pleases the Lord. Kids, here's what I want you to think about for just a minute. If you recognize that, that you are a sinner in, needs of, in need of God's grace, and maybe you've already become a Christian, maybe you've already trusted Jesus Christ who paid the penalty for your sin, and you love the Lord Jesus so much that when you live, you think, I want to please the Lord. I want to please the Lord, not so that He'll accept me, but because He has loved me and accepted me. I want to please the Lord. And in order to obey your parents in the Lord, in order to please the Lord in His way, you have to be filled with the Spirit. 
The Lord did not give you this command and then leave you to yourself to figure it out, which means even as a child, even as a teenager, you want to make spending time reading the Bible a daily priority, beginning to develop that, uh, that understanding of what Paul told, tells Timothy when he says, all of Scripture is breathed out by God and is po- profitable for teaching and for reproof and correction and for training in righteousness. That means learning how to think right, learning not how to think wrong, learning not how to act wrong, and learning how to act in a right way, teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. In order to be filled with the Spirit, you have to have a genuine conversion. You have to really be a Christian, which is very different than what our culture says when we, when we ask Jesus into our heart. Many people have had a time where they've asked Jesus into their heart, and then they live many, 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 many years. Or people will sometimes say, well, I believe. And very little in their life actually shows that they believe more than the fact that God exists and that He's eternal and that he sent his son to die on the cross, right? John 16 tells us about when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. And he says, because I, Jesus, go to the Father, and you will see me no longer. So when the Holy Spirit came in Acts, part of his ministry was to convict, which means to to make you aware of the fact that you are a sinner, and God is holy, and that creates a problem, right? And so, he, he makes you aware of that. And if you think about it, it might like this, there might be like a, a couple or two or three, depending on how you word this, two or three parts uh, or, re- or, or ingredients, if you will, in a salvation recipe. Now, that's not the best way to say it, uh, I just acknowledge, but, but we're going we're gonna to use it for, for a few minutes here. Uh, there's three parts, and I'll say them real quickly, and then I'll talk about each one. There's, a, there's an understanding part or a knowing part uh, or a cognition. I need to understand that there's a problem. I need to understand that God's holy and that I'm a sinner, and I need to understand that, uh, that, God, that I'm guilty before God right? Our world wants to tell us continually about false guilt. The problem is most of it's not false guilt. It's real guilt. We've done something wrong. We've sinned. We've, we've run away from God. We have real guilt. And only God can deal with your real guilt. Only God has the power to forgive you. So we are guilty before a holy God, and then Jesus, God's sinless Son, died on the cross to pay the penalty to satisfy God's wrath. And that every sinner who believes in Jesus, meaning you know you're guilty before God and you know He paid your penalty personally, and you believe that and you're, you're grieved. Uh, we might call it affection. Your, your, your emotions are affected at some level by the fact that you've offended God with your sin. We might say it like this, as I have my BB gun and I'm aiming at a particular target, and when I pull that trigger, the fact that the BB missed my target just proves that I had something off way up here. The fact that my actions sin or show, out, show forward my sin is actually just the visible demonstration or the proof that there's actually something wrong in here. You see, well before we ever pull the sin trigger, if you will, we've already sinned in our heart. I had already made a determination in my heart to disobey my dad. That was my sin. The windshield? Well, that was just for some extra drama in life. And so we are convicted of that, and we're grieved by that, and we understand that what we have from God is a gracious gift. And then we, we, we put our action into it, or our will into trusting God, our volition into obeying God, primarily through faith. And then we agree with Paul who says this, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. And the life I live now in the flesh, what you see me doing each and every day, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and who gave himself for me. 
Children, you need to ha- be able to walk in the Spirit, which means you need to be a, a, a person who's surrendered to the Spirit if you're going to obey your parents in the Lord. So honoring your parents is right. He makes it real clear. It's the right thing to do. Now, sometimes we just don't love that answer. Isn't that true? We just don't honor your, honor your parents in the Lord for this is right. But we live in a society that says nobody can tell you what's right. You find what's right inside yourself. You, you figure out what's right on your own. And if it feels good to you, then follow your heart. Well, that is a lie. Children, listen, you have people all around you who are lying to you about how to live your life. And we need to go back to the Bible over and over again to see what God says is right, which means what is righteous, what is good, what is profitable, what is helpful. And so Paul is pointing to this real obvious order from the beginning of creation when God made man and woman, and when he put mankind over the animals and the beasts of the field, and and he began to, to move from there. Children are always to honor their parents, right? When you honor your parents, children, this is humble. I don't mean that you pretend to be humble, because that's actually pride. I mean, it's humble to say, I'm not in charge. I'm not in charge. And it's my job to obey mom and dad, right? It's the right thing to do. And listen, as you think about growing up in your life, here's one of the things you need to think about. Before you will ever be able to lead well, you must learn to follow well. If you think you want to grow up and you want to own your own business and you want to lead other people as well, that is awesome. What a great goal if that's God's desire for your life. But before you're ever going to lead a business with any sense of integrity or success, you must learn to follow others well. You need to work a job for somebody that doesn't uh, necessarily treat you properly at every given occasion, and you need to obey them. But it begins by learning how to obey your mom and dad. The word honor has this idea of, of, in the original language in Hebrew, this idea of weight. There's a weightiness to honoring parents. There's There's a heaviness to it. It's often translated glory in reference to the Lord, just the weight and the glory of obeying or honoring the Lord. And so when we take that idea and we pair it with uh, this other word uh, for honor, uh, it, it's, it's like the idea we talk about gold and silver as heavy, valuable metals, right? And so we might say something uh, when we're encouraging somebody, he, he or that, that's worth its weight in gold. Just the idea of weight and heaviness and honor and respect. So listen, kids, to honor your parents is an attitude. It's an attitude of your heart that stems from, from what? Two things, the, 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 the reality that we value and love God and that you respect and esteem and value your mom and dad highly, which you don't always until you're hungry, until you're ready for vacation, until you're ready to go to camp, until you need a form filled out as you get ready to go for college and your mom and dad help you do it, but you realize you need them to get this paperwork filled out. All of a sudden, oh, now I esteem my parents highly. But in the day-to-day of living, when it comes to cleaning your room, when it comes to choosing friends that are helpful for you, I saw some people just be like, he did not just say that. Yes, he did. When it comes to choosing friends wisely, when it comes to learning how to be a, a good student so that you can grow up and apply yourself well in life, now's the time to begin obeying your parents. Now is the time to begin obeying your parents. To honor your parents is to assign this high place of value to them. It's a place of respect. And this respect, listen, this respect is not intended to stop with your parents. But as we respect our parents, as we honor our parents, then we sort of like look to the Lord and say, see, Lord, this is because I love you. And not to offend any parents in the room, but it's really not for you. It's so that you are able to love and lead your children in the way that God has called you to. Now, let me ask this question. Why did I disobey my dad that day? I mean, I, I knew the rule. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a knowledge issue. I knew that I couldn't control life even though I thought I might be able to get away with it. Well, I did what I wanted because uh, it's called, the Bible calls it the pride of life. 
In 1 John, when, Paul, or when John is telling us not to love the world or the things in the world, he talks about the, 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 the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Well, in, in my childhood self, I had the pride of life. I thought I could conquer the world, thought I could do whatever I wanted to do. And even after I broke the windshield, I climbed down the tree swore my friend to secrecy, and I went home, and I tucked my little BB gun in the corner. I even put something in front of it, so it didn't look like I had it out. I was deceptive. I sinned, and then I sinned some more, and then I tried to conceal my sin. The Bible says it's going to find you out. And so later that afternoon, I'm playing in my house, with, or playing in my backyard with my friend, and my mom came out on the porch. I can almost see the scene today. And I heard her say those two words, Matthew Evan, will you come here? With a smile that's not really a smile. You know what I'm talking about? It's, you see it and you're like, oh, there's something going on behind that smirk. I'm about to get it. I knowingly disobeyed, and then I lied about it. And then when questioned about it, I lied about it some more. I sinned, and then I sinned, and then I sinned, and then I sinned. Four to 10 or 15 sins, they all came from one sin, pride. Pride of life. I disobeyed mom and dad because I wanted to live life by my own set of rules. Kids, God's given your mom and dad rules that they're to follow, and then they're to help you learn how to follow those rules. They're to help you learn what it's like to live to follow the Lord, and that's going to be next week. That's your mom and dad's greatest purpose on this earth is to worship Jesus and to teach you how to fear the Lord in a healthy way and how to love Him and how to follow Him. So they have a mission from God that affects you. And so you're to learn to submit to them, to honor them, to obey them, right? So we think about sometimes playing in a backyard, uh, and you might have a fence that's around a backyard. Maybe a house is, is near a road, and, and there's a fence in the backyard. Most kids will play in that backyard, no problem, right? They're really not paying too much attention to the fence. I just know that as long as I stay within this fence, I'm safe. And the mom and, mom and dad or mom and friends are, can sit on the porch, on the back porch, and they can drink coffee, and they can talk to their friends, and everybody can be pretty relaxed. But as soon as a child, a, a two-year-old, a three-year-old, a four-year-old, a 12-year-old makes it to the gate or hops over that fence, the coffee is over and may be thrown onto the ground, and the parent is making a beeline for the parents because there's something outside of that fence that could cause you harm, and your parents don't want you to experience harm. And the rules that God has given us, like obey your parents and the Lord for this is right, is a fence that God places around your life. It's a fence that God places around your heart to help protect you from a world that so much wants to destroy you. It may not be cars that are zooming by each and every day, but it may be a worldview, a, a worldview system, a, a lie that they're trying to tell your heart to believe, that you just need to find truth within yourself, and you need to obey that truth. And your parents say, no, we need to cling to the Bible because God loves us. The world doesn't love us. God loves us. Satan is, he seeks to steal and to kill and destroy. And these, this fence called obey your parents and the Lord for this is right, honor your father and mother, is the first command that comes with a promise. Do you hear the goodness of God in there? Do you hear the, the kindness of God in there? The most important lesson has to do with when God tells our, our, His children to obey the Lord for it is right. It's the right thing to do because God has said so. And when you and I and extending to parents, here's something that God tells us that is right. We make ourselves God when we decide what God said is not right, what I think is right. You see, so when I had the idea to pull that BB gun up to my shoulder, now I wasn't thinking all of this out right then, but what was happening in my heart? Mom and dad gave me rules, and I don't think they're right. And I trust myself, and I'm going to believe myself. And I elevated myself 
to be God in my life. I took a sledgehammer to the fence that God had placed around my heart, and I knocked that fence down, and I said, I don't need protection. I don't need barriers. I can live my life accordingly to how I want, and I think this is right, until I realized all of a sudden it wasn't. And if I could only tell you how many ways that has affected my life. God gives this promise because it's a, it's a, it's a promise that comes with reward. It's not wrong to seek good rewards that God has given us. When God gives you a promise like delight yourself in the Lord, make yourself happy in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. It's not bad or wrong to desire good things from the Lord as long as our desire is to honor them or honor him with them. If it's a reward that God promises in the Bible, it's a good reward and go after it because essentially we're going after God. It's the first commandment with a promise. Essentially, he's saying, this commandment is stated five times in the New Testament, uh, and and here is the time it includes a promise as well. And so, listen to Psalm 78. He says, it's a a promise that's given two reasons, okay? We're going to hit them quickly. The first reason, or the first part of it is that it may go well with you, which is just generally, it's a general principle of life. There are children who obey their parents, and their parents are not uh, kind to them, and there are bad things that happen and really wrong things that happen. This is a general principle in life that says, if you learn to obey your parents in the Lord, it will go well with you, generally speaking. Listen to Psalm 78. He established a testimony in Jacob, and he appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach their children that the next generation might know them. These principles that God gave us to uh, protect us and help us know how to live, that the next generation might know them, the children that are yet unborn, and arise to tell them to their children so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God. In other words, the parents were to say, uh, 20 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, we were in dire straits, and here's how God protected us. Here's how God saved us. Parents, our kids, When your mom and dad tell you stories about the goodness of God in their own personal life story, listen up really well, because God told them, you keep telling these things to your children so that children that are not even born yet, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren might hear this and understand one day, so that they shall not forget the works of God, but keep His commandments. Why? And that they should not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not steadfast and whose spirit was not faithful to God. There's a general principle of well-being that says children who learn to grow up and obey their parents will typically grow up and learn to obey their boss, will grow up and learn how to obey others in society in a right and biblical way, and will generally be well-spoken of in the community because they've learned to not have to be the boss of themselves all the time, but to trust others. And the second life principle is that you may live long in the land. Let's just face it, guys. At the end of the day, your mom and dad are going to tell you not to do things that are going to hurt you. That's right. Because they like you, they love you, and they want you to live for a long time. Right? And sometimes they may be harsh with it. If my kids are running for the street, I'm not going to say, Hey, guys, would you consider slowing down so that you don't become road meat in 12 seconds? No, I'm going to say, stop running. Sorry, I was loud. It's going to be like that. Why? I I have one goal, to keep them alive for the next, well, as long as I can. But especially for the next 30 seconds is what we're going after right now. It's my immediate goal. Kids, your parents are going to tell you things that you aren't going to like, that you're not going to understand, and you need to learn to say, I love Jesus. And so I want to obey my parents. And we grew up using the phrase, it's time to obey with a happy heart. Your attitude and obedience is what shows the heart. You can obey the actions and be sinning against God all day long. And God says, obey your parents in the Lord. Obey your parents with a happy heart. 
Mark Twain is, you know, we've often heard it say that when he was 17, uh, he was amazed at how stupid his father was. But when he turned 21, he was shocked at how much his dad learned in four years. Kids, you don't think your parents understand all of your struggles and issues and challenges right now, but I promise you, according to God and life experience, they know more than you think, and they love you, and they want the very best for you. Obey them. Some, some think, if I had godly parents, I could actually honor them and obey them. This, this principle does not say, obey your parents if they're Christians, if they always do the right thing. Just in the same way that when Paul is talking to wives, he doesn't say, wives, uh, submit, submit to your husbands when they do everything in a godly way, right? Next week, as, as Pastor Brian, or not next week, in two weeks, Pastor Brian is going to be talking about what it means to, to, for slaves and masters and what that principle looks like, right? Employees and employers, and what does that look like? It doesn't mean obey or honor or submit to or render yourself to when they do everything right. It says we entrust ourselves to the Lord so that we can obey even when things are especially not right. I said earlier the way that children are treated in a very utilitarian, less than, uh, less than uh, front and center way when the church of Ephesus is reading this letter, okay, they... they, they, they uh, there would have been plenty of reason in that church for children to have said, really, these parents, this way, this is what's happening? And the Lord says, you learn how to obey me when you learn how to obey your parents. So what do you do in that situation, right? We're assuming that there's not something law, law-breaking going on, that there's not, um, there's not unlawful abuse going on or abuse, anything like that, right? If that's the case, you report it to the right authorities and do so quickly. Don't wait and don't waste any time. You just have an honest conversation with authorities that you trust uh, in that way. But in, in most cases, we're talking about parents that you might just not approve kids of what their decisions are. So what do you do? Well, you ask God for for wisdom. James says, ask God for wisdom, and he'll give it to you so long as your goal is to, to, to glorify him, to, to not just get your way and have your own happy life according to your standards. Thank God for giving these parents to you. You listening up, kids, if you're a teenager? It may have been a long time since you've said, God, thank you for my mom and dad. Thank you for my dad and my stepmom. I know life is hard and it doesn't always go according to plan. I'm thankful for the parents that you've given me. I'm thankful for the grandparents that, that you've given me, Lord, who, who are able to help my mom or who are able to help my dad because sometimes families split and life is hard and life is complex and life is complicated, but God is always good and he puts people in your life to love you, to protect you, to nurture you. Show a godly attitude to them, even or especially when they're making wrong parenting choices. And I'll tell you one reason why. Parents, when you make wrong parenting choices, one of the best things you can teach your children is repentance and reconciliation. To go to your child and say, when you disobeyed, I was really ungodly in my response to you. Now, you were wrong, and so was I. And the Lord has helped me see my sin, and I want you to know that I'm sorry. Will you please forgive me? Go all the way. Don't just say, I'm sorry. We don't do, as Rob Reno says, sorry, it's okay. Sorry, it's okay. I'm sorry, it's okay. No, it's not. It's a sin. And sin affects people. It affects our view on life. And so we say, I'm sorry. What I did was wrong. I know that I hurt you. Will you please forgive me? And then you give them space to let the Lord work in their heart. Church family, could you imagine how our church life would be different if we would learn to acknowledge our sin against the Lord and how we wrong other people and how we go to the Lord and we repent of it, but then we go all the way, we acknowledge the specifics of it. And I'm not talking about non-apology apologies. So I'm about ready to start a whole other sermon right here. I'm not talking about, I'm sorry if you were offended. I'm not talking about, oh, I'm sorry if I've ever done something to hurt you. No, I'm talking about my attitude toward you was selfish, 
short-sighted, and my tone of voice was hurtful. I communicated to you that I don't love you when nothing could be further from the truth. I sinned, and I hurt you. Children, to your brothers and your sisters, or to your parents. Mom, I'm sorry that I argued for 15 minutes when you told me to clean my room. Will you please forgive me? Not a parent in the world that won't say, absolutely, absolutely. When Samuel was was eight years old, he, he began to, or not, that was Josiah. When Samuel had a close relationship that started when he was very, very young as a child. King Josiah was eight years old when he started to lead, and a young teenager when he, uh, when he brought a renewal to the land of Israel. As a young teenager, he said, we need to tear down these, these uh, Asherah poles. We need to tear down these idols. Children, at a young age, you can make a difference for God's kingdom. David was just a boy when God started using him. Queen Esther was a young woman when the Lord used her to save her people from annihilation. And John the Baptist was filled with the Spirit in the womb. God is painting a big, masterful picture, and He uses people in ways that we would never draw up or imagine on our own. And so your your initial learnings about what it's like to walk in the Spirit are to say, I'm going to obey my mom and dad. For this is right. And because God promises good according to how He gives good gifts to His children. When Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane, He he didn't want to do what the Father's plan was. In fact, He he, he talked with the Father about it. He said, Father, is there another way? No. Really, is there another way? No. Are you sure there's not another way? No. Can you guys wake up and please pray for me? Not my will. Okay, Dad. I'll obey you. And Philippians says it was for the joy that was set before him that he endured the cross. He knew that his obedience would usher in great promise and reward. And as we eat and drink this cup this morning, We do so as a reenactment, as a reminder that Jesus, God's Son, gave His body to be broken out of obedience to His Father. And He gave His blood to be spilled out of obedience to His Father so that we have the opportunity to obey and to love Him. Let's pray. Father, we ask You for help and mercy all the day because we know that uh, that we will not obey you rightly, we will not obey you fully on our own. We need your help in it. But the very things that you call us to do are the very things that you equip us for. And so we just want to acknowledge, and you might be a child in here right now hearing me pray, and you might want to just um, pray in your heart right now, Lord, I'm sorry for not obeying my parents. Or I'm sorry, Lord, for doing the actions but having a really bad attitude and talking to my friends about, uh, badly about my mom and dad. And you might just even say to the Lord right now, God, I'm sorry for sinning that way. Will you please forgive me? And children, you may even need to go home today and tell your mom and dad, God really made me think about some things at church today. And maybe there's a specific way you disobey your parents that they don't even know about yet. And God says that there's freedom if you will confess that and ask for your parents' forgiveness and together go to the Lord and ask God for His forgiveness. We will always find blessing and joy and peace when we confess our sin and we receive the Lord's forgiveness and we forgive one another. Let's worship Him together now.